All right, I think I got the last adjustments. Uh, yep, it's working. Here you go. There you go. That drill should be working for you now. All right, remember, folks, uh, we're going to be talking about the Artificer today, and I know they're all about building stuff up, uh, but we're going to break them down. We're going to drill down a bit. Uh, we're talking Artificer on WebDN. And don't shine the light. That's how you get RK9, Jim. That's safety first. This episode is brought to you by World Anvil, the ultimate world-building software and campaign manager for DMs. Join their community of over a million DMs and storytellers and access everything you need to create worlds, manage campaigns, and give your players the resources they need. Not only does it come with the complete D&D 5e SRD and materials for over 500 other systems at your fingertips, but there's also a dice roller, character sheets, and so many tools to run fantastic games. The free version gives you access to all major features, or use the code WEBDM on checkout to get 25% off a yearly membership today, and that gets you even more. Link in the comments and description. All right, Jim. You. It is time to talk about the thing that I, I wanted to talk about for since before D and D was invented. Somehow, let's yeah. talk about the artificer. Let's do it. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Now I mean, we have an actual official class. I mean, it's it's completely official. It was an Eberron, but uh, you know, now it's not in. Uh, uses yeah, not everybody uses Eberron or bought that, but now it's in Tasha's. And if you believe the news articles being printed, everybody's buying it because. The artificer is going to say most, fifth edition. <laughs> it's the most important candy. All right. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, that it's, aside. it's official now. That aside, artificer. I, lo I love it. I love the idea of the artificer, and I find the mechanics of it really, really tight, and 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 sort of like shares a uniqueness that maybe warlock is the only other class that has the level of customizability and choice and and variety yeah. of, of flavor to the to the class um and so like it, it bears a lot of this on the shoulders of like the uniqueness of its magic the fact that you're creating these physical objects that are imbued with magical power and all that other kind of you know stuff that it's it's a it's a fun idea it's a fun mm -hmm. execution it's an interesting execution mechanically a lot of different ways you can play it. I, I like a class that doesn't have an obvious use in, in the party, you know, so that, that to me seems like it either has a lot of different ways you could fill different roles or that it's, it's sort of a challenge to find out where your place in a party is going to be. And they just give you a lot of means to carve that out for yourself. And so in that sense, I really, really love the artificer as a class like in third edition too, right 3.5 had a lot of yeah both fellow party members uh that that were artificers as well as dm'd for them um but there are some drawbacks right it changes the style of a setting and style of a game it makes assumptions about the setting that you're in that might not fit with the world that dms have created or that you've created through play and yeah. and that's worth addressing it's it's worth saying like yeah if we if we introduce this class that has a sort of mad inventor, pseudo-technologist feel, and certainly 5th editions does, right, from the art to the way they talk about it, it it's almost steampunky, right? And, and that's mm -hmm. going to change your setting. If you're not ready for it, if you don't want that, then you're either going to have to, like, reflavor some of the abilities and reconceptualize them, or just kind of say, like sorry <laughs> let's wait for a game where this is more appropriate or carve out a tiny space and be like well you might be the only one right but it nevertheless it does sort of change that um and before we really dive into things I'd like just state sort of up front that there's a lot that we're going to talk about especially from my end that might sound like quibbling over minor details and and might come across as like negativity or something and i'm here to tell you it is not <laughs> the more i love yeah. something the more i am passionate about something then the more those little details matter and the more the the you know one of those details being off or not quite executed well will change the experience of playing it for me which is the only place i can talk from right it's not necessarily an objective fact you might not be bothered by it um also i don't critique things i don't like <laughs> 
I don't like well, them, yeah. so I don't think about it. Yeah, you don't put forth the <laughs> right. effort. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> you don't like it. It's like, eh, that's not for me. <laughs> yeah, it's not for me. I'm just not going to care. So I, when we get into it, especially the mechanics, when we get into it, um, there will be a lot of quibbling and a lot of like, you know, like, well, this one little thing isn't working. And to me, those are moments to either, you know, change things on my own. Not everybody can do that. Not every DM lets them or play style lets them. But if you're looking for a specific type of type of artificer, a specific type of, of character concept, then those little details are very big. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. uh, as we're talking about the mechanics of it, um, we that's sort of I want our viewers to kind of keep in mind and our listeners to keep in mind. Because, uh, yeah. Definitely. Well, and, and I would just speak to your point on whether or not it works in, in the theme of your campaign. I mean, let's not forget in Greek mythology, which predates, you know, Certainly. the pseudo Europe European style that D and D is based off of. Mm -hmm. You had a mm -hmm. God named Hephaestus who is literally an artificer. He Certainly. literally creates like mechanical things with his magic <laughs> and gears and whatever. Yeah. I mean, like, and if you look at the history of automatons, like actual mechanical ones in the Turks. in the real world, <laughs> mechanical Turks. Like the like in if you go to Asia and like it's it's insane. These things that can actually write and they were built in the you know one one thousands. Like some before that. Uh, before my that, yeah. my dates yeah. on those are are off, but I know I've looked this up before when I was making my my artificer. Like mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. to just kind of like have that ammo, you know, to be yeah. like, well, you know, we've been doing this for a long time without magic. And Certainly. now you're telling me there's magic, but you're saying I can't make this because it's technology. So, yeah. right. you know, arm Re yourself with history it. before you're approaching your DM. But uh, right. but the DM always has has their final say. Um, sure, sure. And if you love these kind of interactions like that, we've uh, we've talked about Tasha's in our Patreon uh, podcast. Yeah. So if you log on over on uh, Patreon and and come become a patron, you get a little bit more uh, in depth, a little bit longer form of discussion on stuff like this. We recently went through uh, a bunch of uh, the subclasses from Tasha's, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, it was a fun discussion. But it was, uh, the gym, was. yeah, yeah. Uh, we're, we're we're right now artificers on the barbecue, and let's get to the heat of the meat. Let's do. It. Let's talk about some. <laughs> uh, let's talk about some mechanics first off, and just kind of like kind of get through this, just so the people at know at home know uh, where uh, where we're coming from as far as themes when we get into that sure. later on and concepts. Sure, sure. So. For me, mm -hmm. there's very little divide between mechanics and the narrative of a class. They right. well, reciprocate yeah. and support each other. They're not disassociated from each other. And, you know, they're, they're not just two sides of the same coin. They are meshed. <laughs> they, they're, they're one and the same. Um, this, mm -hmm. this plays into why I don't think role-playing versus role-playing is a healthy or productive way of thinking about play styles. Um, and that's the lens that I'm viewing the artificer from. Because when I look at the artificer, I see a lot of really cool mechanics, a lot of really ways to interface with the system that's, that are interesting and produce interesting gameplay. And then what feels like to me, a different set of flavor that comes with it. Mad inventors, you know, uh, you know that the, they're that people don't see them as casting spells. It doesn't appear as though they're casting spells. Yeah, mechanically they are, right? The yeah. question then comes like, can you counterspell an artificer? Can you dispel magic as in cancel the magical effect completely of artificer magic? And it's those kind of questions that when I go through the mechanics and start reading things and sort of like piecing together how I would play the class, how I would change things up if I was running it at the table, that I noticed the biggest thing for me, and the more I read the class, the bigger it got <laughs> until it kind of mm -hmm. gets to the end and I'm looking at the 20th level ability, I'm like, what does that look like in the fiction of the game? Because to me, that's where the story of D&D lies, is the interaction between mechanics and the narrative that these classes have inherent in them, even the most bland, generic, make this what you will class or class feature is still embedded in the game world. It still manifests yeah. in the game world as a mechanic. And so to have that disconnect of like, eh, just describe it differently. That might work for some. That might be enough for some people and some groups. 
but it's not enough for me. And while it doesn't prevent me from ever playing the class, it doesn't prevent me from letting someone else that I'm DMing a game for play the class. And I would let them take the lead in how they uh, conceptualize their magic. It does say to me, like, maybe we could have taken a step or two further with the execution of this and make sure that the mechanics match the flavor of it. And so, like... Overall, that's how I feel. That's sort of my first impression of the artificer, is that this, this, there's a disconnect here that's not quite working for me. And and so, what specifically are you talking about uh, as that disconnect? Or is is, is this your uh, verbal and somatic components <laughs> for spellcasting? So for, for spellcasting, yeah. So you have to have, um, or you're able to use either thieves tools which seem leaves me scratching my head um or any other type of artisan tools as a spell focus so spell focus mm -hmm. replaces the material components of a spell in dungeons and dragons the material components of a spell correspond with most for the most part with uh, the feel of the magic so melf's acid arrow you know the, the gallbladder of an adder right or or the classic one is fireball a little bit of sulfur, a little bit of back guano, creates this uh, magical effect, this explosion of magic. And so to say, you can use these tools as a spellcasting focus for these things, to me, removes the very thing that makes artificers unique, which is that they use mundane objects to produce a magical effect. And the further I, I sort of like went along in reading 5th edition Artificer, I was like, this is reversed. That they use magic and magical effects to produce a mundane object that you know has some magical you know characteristics to it like the magic comes first and not the artifice not the not the actual tinkering and creation of an object that is imbued with magic and mm -hmm. that the like i said the further along i got the more i was just like man i really wish that the physicality of it Right. This is what separates it from wizard and sorcerer and cleric and all the others is that they make a thing. Mm -hmm. They make an object and that object is magical, but it didn't start magical. It started with some tools and a workbench and a will and a willingness to experiment and an understanding of the way magic works in the D&D world. And through that produces magic. Other magic users in the broadest sense of the word work that magic through spells that they their interface with the background magic and the inherent magic of a D&D setting is through their spell casting. And for an artificer, conceptually, they have a completely different approach to manipulating that magic. And that is through esoteric techniques, a willingness to bend the rules, a willingness to push things to their limit, and to experiment and explore the nooks and crannies of a D&D world for the magic that's inherent in it, and then harnessing it. And to mm -hmm. just see like the cast spells well, okay, like every other caster. And that was where I well, really was like, oh. <laughs> like I was well, so close. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I see your point to an extent, mm -hmm. but like to me, like, yeah, they use tools because they, they have, you know, an energy source on their person and they manage to reroute the, reroute the, bi the bypass in, into the whatever in like, the verbal component becomes techno babble. So if you've ever watched sure. Star Trek and Scotty's fixing, actually, no, you want to go to next gen with Jordy, next and gen. Then, especially in Voyager. One, right? Yeah. Well, no, Voyager is the big one. Voyager is the mm -hmm. one where it's like, every time there's a problem, there's like five minutes of techno babble that really doesn't make any sense. And they then somebody the comes along and gives you, and gives you the, the layman's response, which is, Oh, you mean like bailing water out of a sinking ship? And it's like, yeah. And so, yeah. Like to me, they that is the what the verbal yeah. component is, is mm -hmm. the techno babble of, I need to reroute the encryption to, to form a bypass and pff, there's my, you know, my fireball. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I see your point, but I think that if you, if you were to create a new avenue, then you would have more questions in how their magic interacts with, interacts with the rest of the world. Sure. Um, but in yeah, the I'm end, they are creating. Yeah, I mean, I understand that, but I think they they went with the um, less confusing of two evils. Oh yeah. Of, I, I, to be clear, you know, I completely understand why it works the way it does. Yeah. It yeah. interfaces with the action economy in a way that isn't yeah. a huge pain to deal with. Yeah. It it 
it it works the way it works because people are used to spell slots and casting and all that other stuff. What I'm saying is they didn't go far enough in modifying that base structure. They didn't say you can't be counterspelled. You can't be dispelled. You don't have verbal or somatic components. You only have material components for your spells. There's all these different ways that they could have said using the exception based rules design that this magic is fundamentally different. Because when I see something like, yeah, they just need to use artificers tools to, or art, sorry, artisan tools or thieves tools to produce these magical effects, to cast, there's 19 references to casting spells, uh, at least. What I start going is like, really? Because alchemist supplies are a bunch of glass beakers and burners and, and little things. Like, you mean to tell me that they bust that out in the middle of combat and start doing some alchemy? which only requires one action it's either that or they do it all ahead of time and then produce those effects uh, you know in the moment of combat but because that's not reinforced in the rules it's entirely player description which is if you've got buy-in if you've got players who are willing to go all in on that and to accept the ramifications and the rules of that approach to magic then great that's awesome that's how i would do it but then the sidebar of the magic of artifice says this doesn't limit your casting in any way. It doesn't affect you, which suggests to me that it doesn't have an impact on the world. That it, that that because by the the design ethos of fifth edition, which is to remove as many barriers to play, remove many remove as many barriers to conceiving your character as you want to, that they kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater in some sense. And like this whole class is based around creating physical objects that are in the world, and then it says mm -hmm. those don't matter like this spell is still going to work the way it works and like i said nitpicky small details <laughs> mountains out of molehills yeah. but they they created enough of a disconnect for me excuse me enough of a disconnect for me that i want to really mess with this like i really want like if i'm running this artificer and i've got a player who's like gonna put up with it <laughs> you know then i would say hey we're gonna like just really go over this part and, and make sure that it reinforces the story, the mechanics, the narrative, sorry, the, the story and narrative of the class mm -hmm. through its mechanical implementation. Yeah. Well, uh, to get back on track with the sure. mechanics, <laughs> I will say that magical tinkering is one way that I think they do do that. Yes. Um, yeah. Like, and it's, it is one of my favorite. I know it's one of the, the simplest mechanics or things that they have that you get at first level of Artificer. And it just seems like, ah, oh, it's got like prestidigitation. Mm, but, yeah, you know, it's similar. Yeah. It's like, similar, yeah, but, but, you know, it's a little similar. But, like, I have used every version of magical tinkering I can think of with my Artificer in our, in our home game. And we're seventh mm -hmm, level mm -hmm. now. Um, yeah. But I got to say, the different ways in which you can use uh, the recording where you can tape a creature, you can literally record a creature. And my character had an 18 intelligence. So I have four six second recordings. So that is 24 seconds that you can record a creature up to. I just want to say this. If you ever read the, uh, the, the Tao of Wu, I believe it's the Tao of Wu anyway, of the Wu Tang clan, when they first started, uh, the RZA had a, a sampler that could record eight second samples. And so sure. they made complete songs out of that using eight right. seconds at a time to record onto a bigger thing. So what I love about it is I've used it to record people so that we use it later on guards while we're mm -hmm. under a disguise because it's like, well, it's obviously their voice. Like, like it's just such a very simple thing. Um, but the different ways you can use it. I mean, I did like an etch a sketch light up when we were buying free rounds of beer at the uh, at the end, where you just have the thing that lights up and the words change. Like, right. I mean, it's this, this is something that just to me, like, I was like, well, you know, I mean, sure, I can make four lights, but like, you know, you take those and throw them out in the ground. You don't have to worry about you know, them in water. Um, yeah, yeah, you don't have to worry level. about getting it back, things like that. Yeah, don't have to worry about getting it back. You just make a new one. Who cares? Uh, yeah. I don't know. I just I really enjoy the magical tinkering uh, uh, in the in just the way different ways you can use. I mean, the limit is literally your imagination. Yeah, it's it's a it's an ability like this. It's a class feature like this that I really like because it creates something in the world. It tells you generally what it does, and and then puts the rest in the player's hands of like, do what you want with this. And in that sense, like it shares mm -hmm. the same 
conceptual space as the tools themselves, like just tool proficiencies and, and all the various types. Like I love them because, all right, this, uh, you know, the Smith's kit comes with these tools that you can use to manipulate and change the game world. And, and that, in the same sense, magical tinkering does that for me. I think it's a really great uh, feature for my artificers to start out with. All right, so that's enough tinkering around with magical stuff. Let's talk about uh, other kinds of magical tinkering. Uh, spells. Uh, we've already we've already gotten through some uh, some issues, but uh, as far as the general spell casting, none of that's really changed. Um, and uh, now the wizard is better at cantrips than the artificer. <laughs> yeah, so, we're versatile with them. Yeah, welcome to the yeah. Com- welcome to the club, though. You can change. <laughs> welcome them. to race ahead of us, wizard. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, hey, shouldn't they catch up? Well, now they're way past us. Wait, wait. No, they're rather way ahead. Yeah. yeah uh, but yeah. no, I mean, I, I, I've always liked the, the the changing the cantrips at each level. Um, I find it's yeah. uh, it's a it's a valuable tool. I've used it a lot. Um, I like changing things up. You know, when when mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. the time comes. Um, yeah, there are some cantrips that are really useful at lower levels and less so at, at higher. Like to me, I'm kind of thinking so like Thorn Whip. Really like it. Uh, you know, at lower levels, but at higher levels, you probably want something else. You mm-hmm. know, the range, the, the what it does, the damage. You know, to me, it's not doesn't keep up. But I mean, that's just an example of it. But they have a strong cantrip selection, and oh, and definitely. even just general spell selection overall. Oh, definitely. And I did try the thorn whip for a while. I used it a couple times uh, to varying degrees of effect. Uh, but you know, eventually. I changed it over for Mage Hand because there were just times where I just <laughs> needed to just pick something up. I just need I need that over there, over here, and I want to walk. So, right. You know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I like it on my Ranger. But that's a completely different show. Um, so I I I like it. You know, they're a half caster like uh, Rangers and Paladins, but they lean heavier into that caster half, uh, with the exception of Battlesmith and Art of, or Armor, mm-hmm. um, and. It's a, it's, it's good. It does what it needs to do as a support class. And like when I read down the spell list, I can imagine most of these as coming from an object as, you know, like this is a potion. This is a, you know, something that you affix to a weapon, a rune you inscribe or paint on something, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, most definitely. Uh, It's to me that my, my hardest thing when picking my spells each day is what first level spells am I going to pick? Because the like to me the first level spell selection for artificer is is solid AF like as far as mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. range between like attack utility uh, uh, buff debuff like I mean it's it's a it's I haven't I, I haven't actually everything. really I don't know about Ta- Tasha's caustic brew but um, I like you know, it it's fun I mean it's it's a thirty foot stream of acid so. It's, it's, it's a 30 foot stream of acid you know the damage doesn't kick in until uh i believe the second round you know when the start of the enemy's next turn but it is a 30 foot line of acid um which is uh, good for a first level spell very good oh most definitely um <laughs> but yeah the the eternal choice between like fairy fire and cure wounds uh <laughs> and, oh, yeah. i mean oof anyway um, it really it really reinforces the spell is really reinforces like the, the artificer's role as spell support because even with like alchemist it's it's hard to be a main healer for your uh for your party um you know so it's it's if you want you can supplement uh you know a cleric or a druid or whoever's uh, healing powers a uh, bards um or you can kind of go the opposite round like you know what i'll pick up the spells that maybe the the full casters in the party would otherwise skip because they're going for something else Mm -hmm. and so you're like okay well i maybe i will take this say fairy fire because our druid or whatever is is doing something else with their first level spells you know up up casting or increased casting you know the you know you not useful but different kinds of utility from their first level so i think it you know reinforces their support role in that sense it 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 does what it needs to do Mm -hmm. if anything I could see a larger variety of cantrips uh, and a larger variety of, say, necromantic damage spells <laughs> uh, oh. in terms of, uh, you know, what's what's available. Spe- I'm thinking specifically about the alchemist and getting the most out of their uh, their class features. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, I completely agree. Uh, but we'll uh, we'll get to subclasses uh, here. In sure. Minute, yeah, yeah. I think that's where that can be solved. Uh, I also have some issues with mm-hmm. the armor. I saw what you did to me, Tasha's. Um, and so, 
Um, you know, uh, and of course, they, you know, they have ritual casting as long as you prepare it. That's fine. It's whatever. Um, yeah, I expect but, that. You know. But uh, yeah. yeah, as far as spell casting goes, uh, to me, Artificer is a, it's got a good range of spells. It has uh, what you need as long as you, as long as you have a good solid theme. I think it's very easy to, uh, to pick spells to make that theme become reality. Um, I, I know yeah. up through yeah. seven levels, uh, and getting up to, you know, second level spells, like I still like, you know, I, I pretty much am trying to recreate all the Avengers with my spells because now I'm enlarging <laughs> you. I'm giving you some pim particles, uh, <laughs> sure. Right. <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's fun it's, to play an enlarged barbarian. It, hey, an enlarged barbarian that already has a reach weapon here, have a little bit more, you know, <laughs> bugbear, no less. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I find it supports that in a wide variety. The fact that it's sort of like casting like a cleric or a druid is, is, uh, is certainly an added benefit to that. Um, and again, like my quibbles with a lot of this are largely aesthetic and, mm -hmm. and sort of relate to, you know, the, the interface between fluff and mechanics to put it a different way. If I were, playing an artificer or rather when I play an artificer one of the things that I would do is just point out that like when I'm preparing spells th like I am actually preparing physical objects that I have on my person that then sort of get used in that moment and and a lot of it will rely on description because if I'm playing an artificer then I'm not going to ask the DM hey will you use my homebrew rules <laughs> and mm -hmm. changes to the artificer and you know, it, it highlights the fact that player buy-in is important. I'm all in, going to do the description, going to make it work. Um, and so in that sense, the spell list supports that, right? Yeah. Well, you I know? mean, the first time I played an artificer using the UA rules, I sort of did that with the spells. If you recall, Jim, like, I was like, can I transcribe them on, like, gems that I slide forward in my viewfinder and cast the spell off of that? But that's me, like, picking my spells is me creating these things that I manipulate in my helmet because uh, I mm -hmm. wanted, like, that, that the heads-up display kind of thing. Um, but that's all that, I mean, again, though, that's all like flavor for the person, uh, to create the artificer in the way that, uh, they want to. And of course, working out mm -hmm. with the DM, mm -hmm. um, sure. but, uh, moving on from that, uh, let's, let's, yeah. let's get to the infusions because this is, this is the, you know, that's their that's version of invocation butter. sort of kind of not really. But it's kind like, of, that's yeah. how I see it. Like, yeah, it's, that's how it's the second set of like, these are my other abilities that I can do based off of the, the thing that I chose. But the infusions um, yeah. are, they're, they're, a, they're a nice solid array of, you know, you have your offense, you have defense, you got utility. Uh, and that's just like yeah. the general infusions. That's not even drilling down into the, like the yeah. magic item replication. Replicate magic item, yeah. And I do think this is where we really get to what it was that the 3.5 artificer had going for it and and like how it operated in a party because every time i saw one played whether it was like i said as a fellow party member or as a dm they're they're handing out magic items like all the time they're using that uh spell uh scribed item that spell storing item which five fifth edition artificer gets later and they're spreading the casting and magic abilities around the party and so for fifth edition like the base game assumes that you do not have magic items or you do not have ready access to them. Like they, they necessitate a change in your conception of the game world. If they don't, if they're not already accommodated yeah. through that. And so it could be an issue. Like a, part of the fun of playing an artificer is that you get to control what magic items you have. You get to decide which ones you want. You can change them up as the party grows and changes and the situations they find themselves in are different. Mm -hmm. Plus there's just some really interesting ones there. And, and Tasha's added some new ones, I believe, or at least new ones to me. They might, uh, they might've been in, in Eberron, but I haven't, I didn't really dive that deep into the artificer for Eberron. I was looking at other things there. Um, so like, I don't want to go through all of them because that would be like a three hour show. <laughs> well, that's true. Um, what, what, what are some highlights for you though, as far as infusions? There's a lot of stuff that I'm looking at here where it's, you would, you might call it like, could, you know, everyday convenience or quality of life kind of abilities where, Oh I, yeah, I, we would like someone to be able to use a crossbow more than one attack. 
right so let's give them a repeating crossbow or mm. or you know we don't so and so doesn't have a magic item which is what came up in our home game where we had of the two main meleeers one of them had a magic item and my barbarian didn't and we fought some enemies where that was like that, that was really a... felt like i really felt that <laughs> it's like it was doing half damage <laughs> You know, uh, and I was rolling low that time too. It was like rolling, I think I rolled minimum like five times in a row. Um, and so being able to say, here you go, here's a magic weapon. Mm -hmm. And not just a magic weapon, but with a bonus to it. And like in that sense, that's the artificer's role. They make the party better. Mm -hmm. They create these things that they then, you know, share and, and fulfill that party support role. Um, yeah. But I love infuse item. I love that you get it at second level. I love mm -hmm. that, you know, it expands and you can do other things with it. And it's so versatile and you're not necessarily locked into many choices there. You can change things up, you know, other than the inf infusions, you know, obviously. It's also mind sharpener. Having essentially legendary resistance for your concentration saves is kind of cool. And um, the fact that it is an infusion, you can give it to others <laughs> is also I don't know, really cool. I really like that. There's not a lot that I see as, as like a removing the randomness from concentration checks. You know, there are some things that give you a bonus, stuff like that, but mind sharpener is another fun one. Let's zip through some of these so we can get to the subclasses. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Think? So of course, you know, right tool for the job, you know, you can just create whatever tools you need. Um, yeah. I kind of like that because to other me, tools. What, yeah. what, what, what I see this being is if you don't have the tools on you, like you're literally just digging through your bag and, grabbing different pieces of other tool sets to make a tool set. I know it says that you can just magically yeah. do it. It's a product of magic, they're, though they're non-magical. Um, yeah, to me, yeah, it's just like, oh, I just I, I, I know how to throw stuff together. I know how to, to, to jury rig it, so to speak. I can make it work. Yeah, they, they don't so much. Yeah, they don't so much vanish as you're using those objects for other means yeah. when you redo it. And and it's a lot of the like I said, it's aesthetics, it's language, mm -hmm. it's reconceptualizing reconceptualizing things. The the one thing I want to touch on for right tool for the right job is going through the actual toolkits and what they have in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, which I see as like a companion to the Artificer in many ways, and looking like oh, that's specifically what this toolkit has. Yeah. And then using that to sort of inform which kits you would create with this, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to just like looking at them as holistic packages. You know, they, they actually have individual parts uh, that, that might be useful, uh, but you might not know it just looking at the name of the kit or something like that. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Um, yeah. Uh, ability score improvements, they're, those are pretty standard for 8, 12, 16, 19. That sure. hasn't, hasn't really changed. Um, and then, of course, more tool stuff at 6th level. Tool expertise, mm -hmm. which, I mean, this is this is when you really start in the artificers. If you want to be building a lot of stuff uh, in your downtime, like, this is when things really start to take off, or they should. Um, hopefully by 6th mm -hmm. level, you got some money, you got a little more time, and now you're just that much better at, 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 at creating everything. Um, getting that I would certainly have that reflected. Mm-hmm. I certainly have that reflected as as written you don't actually make roles to create stuff using the tools and by the way we've had a, this summer we did a whole show on tool proficiencies so yeah. refreshing uh that uh, you might guys get some information from that you might get some information from it. um but i would i think like okay you got expertise like maybe th that has that should have some benefit when you're crafting something mm -hmm. and given the length of crafting times in fifth edition I have no problem going it further halves the time it takes to make something because the crafting times are not conducive to the fast paced adventuring lifestyle that a lot of that a lot of PCs uh, experience. Oh, I, I completely agree. But again, that you, you're going to have to look at play style at the table for that. And and yeah, asking yeah. your you've your, got a lot of downtime. Yeah. You know. Asking your DM like, hey, can we have, since we just finished that big thing, can we give us a couple months like we're, I'm in the shop. I'm let's, let's montage this shit. Um, and yeah. you know, this is, this yeah. is why we have this, um, mm -hmm. uh, seventh mm -hmm. level just got this. Can't wait to use it. Flash of genius. This is of course, you know, within 30 feet, use your reaction to add your intelligence modifier to saving throws, ability checks. Uh, and you know, ain't nothing wrong with that. Uh, and now coupling, uh, yep. kind of piggybacking on, we were talking about with tool proficiencies and everything. Well, this is when you get a you get a you get a solid in the in the text boost to magic item creation, which I know that we've talked many times about about the time it takes, the investment in it, 
Um, but at 10th level, A, you can t tune up to four items at once. So this is where you start getting more. Yeah. Uh, so depending on your subclass, yep. this starts to change things <laughs> a minute, uh, which I can't wait to get there. <clears throat> um, sure, but if you craft yeah. items of a common or uncommon, it takes a quarter of the normal time and it costs half as much as the usual gold. Yeah, so to run down those real quick for those of you who might be scratching your head over how this looks in actual play, uh, in Xanathar's Guide, they have rules for baking magic items, and it's basically six steps. Uh, number one, you need a formula, so mm -hmm. you're going to need some recipe for how to create it. That's something your DM is going to have to consciously put in there, or you can ask for, hey, I want to find a formula for XYZ. Um, need exotic materials of some kind, and the, they give guidelines for what uh, magic item rarity, what CR of creature might, mm -hmm. you, you know, you might be able to use, uh, you know, make use of. Um, there's a gold piece cost for other materials. There's a time cost in work weeks, which is the 40 hour work week. Uh, okay. They detail at the beginning of the, <laughs> the crafting section, what that actually means, what the minimum and maximum times you can spend on things are. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is a, a chance for a complication every five weeks of work. I take these as 10% every five weeks, not like additive. Otherwise, if you're making a legendary item, it's guaranteed, it's guaranteed to go to wrong or there'd be a complication. <laughs> right. um, but the time required is anywhere from one to 50 weeks. Right, that's base time. Almost a the year. The gold required is anywhere from, right, almost a year. The base uh, gold piece is like anywhere from 50 to 100,000 gold. Uh, and so, like, that's what I mean when I say having, quartering, like anything that will bring this down to I can actually do this in a game yeah. is going to, is a plus in my book. Oh, 11th level. I can't wait to get here. Uh, spell storing item, which is. Like like you were saying, it's this is a this is a prime ability of uh, the artificer. Eleventh level. I know in earlier UA versions it was like eighteenth level. Uh, so at yeah, least in fifth edition. Too. Yeah, yeah no, 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 it's like what's the point? Um, nobody gets like as yeah. as we've shown from studies, nobody really gets that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so getting at eleventh sure, level. Sure. Um, the fact that you know you can touch a simple martial weapon uh, or just one item, and the fact that you can use that as your spell focus, that's great. Uh, but a first or luck, second level spell that you can use double your intelligence bonus number of times, which at this point for my right. character, I know I will have a 20 intelligence. So I can infuse yeah. an item for, say, your character. Here, have this ring and you can cast shield 10 times. It's, it's solid. Even though you're limited to first and second level spells, like there's a lot there that mm -hmm. you might want and could be useful. And it only like reinforces the fact that the artificer is there, not just in their own right, but they make the party better. They make the party more effective. So yeah, I, I really think that an infuse item are the core bedrock of the artificer concept and everything else is gravy uh, for that. And, uh, <laughs> and then you get to the capstone, which is both like really awesome and a head scratcher because it does two different things. Soul of Artifice has two features, right? There's the saving throw buff, which awesome, right? And then there's the, uh, you know, you can use an infusion to bring yourself back from, from you know, dropping to zero and bring yourself back to one hit point. Setting aside the, I was zero, now I'm at one and more than likely, I, you know, I'm in more danger than I was before because now it's easier to one shot, kill me with massive damage. Um, the way that this is worded and the way that reactions work and the way that dropping to zero work on my reading, and I could be missing something, this ability does not work as written Yeah. because when you drop to zero, you become incapacitated and incapacitated characters cannot take reactions. And because the reaction trigger happens after, or the reaction happens after the thing that triggers it dropping to zero, you cannot take a reaction to burn an infusion to bring yourself after uh, back up to one. Mm -hmm. Now all you have to do is remove the clause that says with a reaction and have it work more like a half orcs uh, relentless endurance. But the fact that it's written like that and it has this weird interaction with, I, I understand the intent, which is why I would, would go like, yeah, we're just going to ignore that for this, you know. Uh, for tables that, that, you know, either don't have a DM who wants to make that change or, you know, Adventurers League or something like that might not work more than anything. I'm just like, 
like, I, what if you used your reaction before this happened? You know, like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I don't like that it costs reaction. I think it messes with the, the rules in a very weird way. I think it, 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 we're already stretching our conceptual space here with like, okay, how does it work? Like, how is burning the infusion, which might not even be on me. It might be something that I gave to someone else. Let me come back. But we're coming back to like the, the interplay between mechanics and, and narrative and, and whether they're not, they're disassociated from one another or disconnected. And I look at the level 20 ability and I go, really cool that you can bring yourself back. What does it look like? Where's the justification for this in the in the fiction? So we've wrapped up the the core <clears throat> class. Let's get to these subclasses now and um, mm-hmm. really really dig in here. The alchemist. I know this is one of your favorites. It is, and I don't. You know, I think that it's gotten a bad rap, uh, especially since uh, the 2019 UA. Um, I don't think it's garbage. I just think it's different. All of the other artificers, artificer subclasses, lean heavily into the. I'm an armored military sort of combat, uh, you know, what you know, whatever. You know. <laughs> if it works for Eberron. I don't know that it works for every other game. I think there's some weird flavor stuff going on with all of them, um, but they are combat dedicated, mm-hmm. right? Either your tank of an armorer, your tank of a battlesmith, your your range support uh, and, and sort of party buff of the artillerist. The artificer's not that. It's trading focusing on one thing and doing it really well with versatility. And really the only thing I would switch up with artificer is that <clears throat> your experimental elixir yeah. or sorry. Uh, yeah. Alchemist. Right. Thank you. Just wanted to, yeah. Is your, ex- is your experimental elixir on a long rest you choose because you're taking your time, right? You are working right. through what you want and you pick this one and then you spend a spell slot to just get a random one. And I get why it's the way it is now, because if you're spending a spell slot, you should know what you're getting. But to me, in the fiction, it's not making sense. Mm-hmm. And that's where I always start my changes from, is does this make sense in the fiction? <laughs> I enjoy The Alchemist quite a bit because it's a classic concept. There's a lot mm-hmm. of cool stuff going on. I wish there was more necromantic spells, necrotic spells to get its benefit from. But yeah, that bonus spell it's, list. It's a, it's a versatile class. Yeah, the bonus spell list could use slight reworkings, but very slight. Inflict Wounds would be really great on that list. I think it'd be really solid. Um, mm-hmm. You can get most of the other damage types from the base Artificer list. There's a lot of cool stuff. I would have I would have wanted Reincarnate instead of Raise Dead. You know, I think it'd be interesting to be like, I've made this new body for you. Yeah, this, I, <laughs> I tried to clone time. you, but I didn't have <laughs> all of it, work. so I had to use some dwarf DNA. Yeah. <laughs> <And like, laughs> Uh-huh. Uh, when you look at like the 15th level ability, you go like, well, no other artificer gets to cast this level of spells. And if you need a heal or a greater restoration, like it's nice to have one in a clutch. Having yeah. that many lesser restorations is really nice. They're a support class. Uh, and on top of that, you know, you get some you get some solid uh, some solid boosts. I mean, those those experimental elixirs, some of them are pretty good for, you know, very early on being able to being able to freaking fly is that ain't there's nothing to scoff at at third level um certainly not certainly not um so yeah um uh, getting through to the other subclasses classes armor is i mean it's pretty hard not to think of it as iron man you know i mean it is like i mean you look at the abilities <laughs> being able to doff don it in an action you can just imagine the armor opening up and spitting you out or swallowing you whole uh I'm, yeah. just, I'm just going to go ahead and just just get up on this tiny soapbox right quick with the bonus spells, Jim. Let's um, do it. Yeah. Why are you going to take yeah, my shield it. away? Why are you going? Why? That's why are you going to do that, Tasha? Yeah. Huh? I'm looking at you, Tasha. Where's my shield? Why'd you take it away? Yeah. <sighs> anyway. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Anyway. Even the changes to the temp HP that you get uh, and and how that switched up, especially yeah. when you compare it to the artillerist. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, defensive field. Now it's uh, now it's limited uh, by my intelligence bonus as opposed to being unlimited. Um, I'm not gonna lie. I would I would have taken I would have taken uh, intelligence bonus as the amount of temp HP unlimited. I don't like the limitation on it, um, especially with uh, considering what um, what the artillerist gets, which is bullshit <laughs> in my opinion. I was thinking like the guardian armor is, has some of like the most dedicated tanking abilities in the game. Like yeah. the fact that it, when it hits, you hit with those thunder gauntlets, it, 
it, you know, it's like, okay, if you attack anybody else, disadvantage. If you combine that with Sentinel, like you're talking a, a proper tank. Now they don't have necessarily have the hit points, which is why mm -hmm. it's, it sucks to see shield go. Right. Yeah. Um, but you know, they don't have, you know, frontline martial character hit points. There's ways to mitigate that. Um, but it really reinforces the kind of like role for it. And then you get to switch it up and be infiltrator, which I see as having gotten a boost from the UA. And, and there's a lot of fun things you can do with infiltrator. Yeah. You can't wear it as a second skin underneath your clothes, but it's interesting. It, it gives you versatility and kind of like lets the mm -hmm. armorer choose what it is that they want to do. What do you, how do they want to fill this role? And the artificer is already versatile to yeah. get the more versatility on top of that there's just uh i, I think it's a really strong subclass uh oh, yeah. to look at even if most people seem to be talking about the guardian and not the infiltrator <laughs> uh yeah no and and i and what i realize now is like i'm gonna go ahead and give those uh, boots of the winding path a go now because if i couple that mm -hmm. with my thunder gauntlets you roll up in there and give them a couple of punches and guess what you pop back out 15 feet back back up yeah and now you can't attack me unless you want to move away from the, my tank and you know a barbarian yeah so yeah. It, it would yeah. further emphasize the benefit of thunder gauntlet so just remember that you know that's 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 the combo that's like oh yeah why haven't i been doing that um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i was gonna say the last point for me for armorer is the armor modifications because mm -hmm. The benefit of of the artificer is that you give others your magic, that you that you infuse it in an item, give it to others. So to have one that's like you can do more with your armor, and that's cool for your concept, but it also like shifts the focus away from the artificer class as a whole to something different. And mm -hmm. and like I don't necessarily see that as a problem. You know, I don't think it's it, you know it's like terrible. You should not do it, but it does shift focus. And if you have a party who's like, oh hey, we got an artificer, they're really going to help us out. You're like, nope, go on armor. Most of my infusions are going to be about making my character better. And in that sense, I will contribute to the party. Mm -hmm. Conceptually, it you know it requires sort of a, a refocus of the class, which is fine. I love that the artificer has such versatility, yeah. and that their subclasses change up how they play in battle. Mm -hmm. uh, or change a bit in actual gameplay. Well, see, I I don't know I don't know, Jim. I might disagree with you here yeah. because the fact that you yeah. get okay. two extra infusions means that you can still give away some of your infusions, but now you can give some sure. to your okay. armor. So like it's gotcha. more of a yeah. rising tide lifts all ships kind of thing. You don't now I don't have I to decide. Sure. I don't have to decide. Well, I'm going to give one of my infusions away and I'm going to keep two. Well, now uh -huh. I get an uh -huh. extra two, so I can give away two and get an extra one. Um, and so right, right. I don't know. I mean, like, yeah, it, but that's this, all in how this you might be another. It. Yeah. This might be another like white room theory craft kind of thing where in mm -hmm. play, this is like, you no problem at all. And it's more just like reading that you're going like, Oh, what if I think of the worst case scenario <laughs> and then try to go from there, which is not good rules design, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. definitely. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then the, the perfected armor where, um, you know, you basically all your, uh, or you can, you can basically, you get a free thorn whip sort of, where you can pull people into you as, uh, as your reaction. Uh, the fact that it happens as a reaction, you can move someone and get an attack as part of your reaction. It's pretty cool. I'm probably only going to use this ability if I've already gone in the turn and haven't used my uh, reaction for anything else. <laughs> like, sorry. Well, now you don't a, have shield. A, so. I don't, oh, how dare you point it out. <laughs> I still have absorb elements. Um, sure. But uh, but then perfected armor, which is just like a free guiding bolt. Like, I'm going to hit people with my, yeah. with my lightning uh, uh, launcher and now, um, now uh, the next attack roll has advantage. And by this point, you're making they two have attacks. Yeah. They, yeah. You're having two attacks. You attack two different people. I mean, which to me, uh, yeah, I don't there's know. No other limit on it. That would, there's no yeah, other limit. So you can attack two different people and have uh, advantage on both of those people. And they would have disadvantage. Mm -hmm. That's the other big thing. Yeah, it's a yeah. pretty solid class. Love it. Great abilities. Uh, I think conceptually, again, like we've been saying, it requires a reframing of the campaign world if it's not already accommodated. Yeah. Uh, because even looking at some of the art, Tasha's, where it's like, yeah, that's not quite Iron Man. You know, it's like they got runes on the armor. It looks like plate armor itself. It's like it's 
it's clear what we're trying to go with here. Oh yeah. And I think looking at it like, could you reimagine this? Or could you reimagine this as like a dwarven rune smith modifying yeah. their armor? And, I mean, I could. and or could it be that right? Or could it be that it's a sentient armor that you've that you just sort of wear like a mech suit, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, this is this is the armor of a famous warrior or something that that's imbued with their essence and imparts itself to you and gives you some of those boosts and then you reimagine sort of reflavor like yeah it, you could wear it really fast because it like attaches to you right mm -hmm. like you have a power-up scene extend your arms and it all just like puts itself on really quick yeah. Yeah. right <laughs> one thing that i can definitely see that i'm i'm gonna try to do and this is this is cheesy af but you i can create a ring of mind shielding jim um, uh -huh. You know what happens when a wizard wears a ring of mind shielding and they die wearing it? Their sure. mind gets yeah. trapped in it. So I totally want to create an infusion of a ring of mind shielding, give it to an enemy caster, then kill them. Hopefully their mind gets trapped in it. Then I get to put the ring on and I have my own Jarvis. Sure. And that's the only way you're going to get that, with, <laughs> given that the archivist didn't make it in. Yeah, I know, uh, right? <laughs> it sucks, but yeah. But yes, I, I I've thought about this long and hard, and it, there, there's there's uh -huh, great I'm odds. I'm sure. I'm sure. But um, you know, <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, artillerist though, like, man, Oof. what I like about the artillerist is this is the closest I would get to the 3.5 wand adept, right? Like, I'm reimagining mine not as a turret, but like hey, this is a wand I hold. It does all these other things. I can use it to do. You know, sometimes I imbue my wand with this power. Sometimes it's this other power. Mm -hmm. um you know I, I i like that i like the idea of of being a combat mage who has a variety of of tools to use because like they don't want to be casting a lot of spells when they're on the front line so they imbue it in their items and it's like they got this wand they got this amulet they got this thing and that's how i would imagine this class and like it's got some strong stuff right like the defensive turret with its ability to <laughs> to grant tip HP over a wider radius, the ability to give you plus, eventually plus two AC, plus two to your deck saves. Curious how that works with Sharpshooter, but that's a, that's a question that, you know, you work out with your DM. Um, like, does it create a physical object? Sharpshooter gets past it. Is it just a bonus that they call half cover? Sorry, Sharpshooter doesn't work. Um, that's how I look at it. Uh, but I like it. It's sort of a party buff, range support. It's a nice class. Well, yeah, I mean, to me, this class always reminded me, like, this is straight out of Borderlands. This is, uh, I forgot his name. God, there's some strong Borderlands energy. But yeah, yeah. It, like, the dude that just creates a turret that has a wall that you can get behind as long as you're in this range, you uh -huh. heal. I mean, like, it, like, totally, to me, like, oh yeah, somebody really liked Borderlands and liked, what's his name? <laughs> I hate myself. I, I forget as well. I played the whole game with that yeah. guy and I don't remember. His name. It, it was a badass. <laughs> like that was a fun class to play. Uh, but like, yeah. that's what this is. Like you get all that. Mm -hmm. you, you, I mean, like yeah. it's right there. Um, yeah. I, you know, it, I, I will say this. It was a tough, it was a tough call whenever I was first making my artificer where I was going to go artillerist or armor. But like, I, you know, the, yeah, I, I love yeah, that, so. uh, and the, yeah. The, the fact that you get two eventually only like really reinforces that. It's it's like it's a nice, it's a great subclass. And mm -hmm. my only quibble with it uh, is that it leans so heavily into the uh, we you know that we used to be fighting this magical industrialized arcane war. Now we're here. Like it works for Eberron. Yeah, it works for the idea of like mass produced magical warfare that Eberron had. I think it would re would necessitate a reimagining and a reconceptualization for other campaigns that do not feature a last war that left the world devastated. You know, um, mm -hmm. I I have a minor minor quibble with the fact that they're like, oh yeah, we used to blow things up, and now we keep the peace by blowing things up. Just like the Jedi, man. <laughs> Peacekeepers leading a war. <laughs> It's, it's yeah, some Orwellian I, like, I uh, logic is what it is. Right. Um, There's a lot of that in Artificer of like, we caused all this damage, now we're going to clean it up. Where it's like, wait a minute, you're the problem. Why are you over here trying to help us out? Except for the alchemist who's like, hey guys. Anyway, that is a flavor. Is tonic. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I want to um, at least so touch yeah. on, uh, I got to touch on this. I'm sorry, but the, the protector. Go for it. 
I mean, yeah. I'm sorry. How, how often? How often can you give anyone within ten feet temporary HP equal to one d eight plus your intelligence mod? I don't know. I have the book open in front of me. What do you? I what mean, do you? I, what, I, do I we do. Have? what do you have? And uh, yeah, it just says anytime you activate it. And as a bonus, yeah. uh, as a bonus action, you can activate it. Yeah. Which that's you're you're upset about it because the armor the armor doesn't have yeah, the, we lost the, it. Yeah, we the lost type it. of yeah you lost it yeah no. it's a strong feature right the protect the protection or the protector uh, turret is a great combat support uh, you know type feature especially if you have a lot of like meleeers yeah who would appreciate that level uh, of support and then eventually you give them the half cover bonuses to their armor class and dex saves so yeah I, it's strong right I'm surprised it didn't get toned down a bit. Uh, but I'm also not surprised if that makes sense. Like it's, it's focused on what it does and it does that very well. Yeah. And, and that sense it's a strong, uh, subclass. Most definitely. All right. Now let's get to it. Let's get to that, uh, that battlesmith, that steel defender. Uh huh. I mean, what you, what you, yeah. what you think about this, Jim? Ooh, man. So after alchemist, this is my favorite artificer. Yeah. And, and I, I love the just the theme of it. You know, like maybe you're the first one that's creating like a a you know a combat not not so much an iron golem but like a combat construct, mm -hmm. right? Iron golem's got this huge process. You got to have the book. It takes all this time. It it's a bit much, right? <laughs> it's a bit too much for what you need. Maybe you need something that's more versatile and the like. So really like the steel defender i am not up on all the ways that the actions uh, interact with each other and the like how much it can do what it can do um but i know that conceptually it leaves a lot of room for different uh interpretations of the the, the battlesmith if you're mm -hmm. a small uh, character gnome or a halfling are you gonna ride it around i certainly would you know <laughs> I'm gonna create something that you can ride around or something like that even if it's bipedal Maybe just sit on its shoulders and, and mm -hmm. like go from there. Uh, there's just all, so many different ways that you can take it and imagine it. And that's like on top of everything else that the Battlesmith gets, uh, which are, you know, got some good bonus spells or, or rather uh, extended spells there. There's yeah. uh, a lot of different, it's not a lot of flavor you can get. And it's also the closest to like Arcane Paladin. As I think you're going to get the fact that they have those martial proficiencies. Um, yeah. That's really what uh, what's doing it for me for the battlesmith. It's well, yeah, very it's, cool, very yeah, evocative. As, as far as the action economy goes, it's it's kind of the same as the humuncul humunculus, I believe. Like it, mm -hmm, it can move mm -hmm. and use its reaction on its own. It can only take the dodge action, but you can use your bonus to give it a command. So you know, sure, in that regard, yeah. you know, that's all right. You know, like I do like uh, I do like the Battlesmith. It's uh, it is. Um, I mean, it's a beast, and also the uh, the I like the I like the weird uh, spells, the extended spell list, um, because this is more of a. Um, I mean, aura of vitality is pretty. Uh, you know, <laughs> ain't nothing to scoff at. <laughs> Could be helpful. <laughs> it's what I'm, yeah, it's, yeah. It's there's what I'm that. There's a lot of there's a lot of good stuff there, like Arcane Jolt, which is one of their class features. Like mm -hmm. it's a non-reaction reaction. You know how yeah. cool is that? Yeah, <laughs> you, know? you do this, you also get uh, that. <laughs> well, it's like the monk. It's like the monk get open it, hand. It's improved. Like, you know when you when yeah. you spend uh, key points. You know it's kind of that. I, so I like I like the use of of mechanics like that in other classes. So. Yeah, yeah, and and for me it's. You know, when I think of artificers, my default is Eberron. Mm -hmm. I know that the the sort of the flavor of a lot of this and, and the introduction to the class mentions other places their right. artificers exist. But to me, the concept of, of artificer is very much tied to Eberron with its widely available low level magic, with the fact yeah. that they have mass produce magic items uh, and, and that there are whole dragon mark houses dedicated to that, that they use them in warfare. They arcanized warfare. Yeah. You know, and in that sense, all three of the other uh, subclasses outside of Alchemist fit within that frame. 
And I'm curious to see what other subclasses are going to come out for Artificer that don't rely on that theme of we used to be warriors and 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 in combat engineers and the like for this massive war and instead lean into the we create magic out of mundane objects, mm -hmm. right? Uh, one of the ways that I reimagine Alchemist uh, for uh, Land Between Two Rivers is, uh, is to take a character and go like, listen, this landscape is suffused with magic. There is nothing apart that's that's part of this landscape that has not been deliberately altered by the use of magic. I just know how it all works. Mm -hmm. Through trial and error, I know that if I take this root, this plant, mix it with this dirt, and you just it's going to be gross. Just eat it, you know. <laughs> you know that I was digging around somewhere and, and I found this thing and I did some modifications on it, and now it does this, you yeah. know. So you know, Lamb Between Two Rivers is deliberately post-apocalyptic, uh, you know, channeling some dark sun, a little bit of Numenera and the like, and so it works for that kind of setting. Um, but it's those kind of like reimaginings of things that. Yeah. I want that I that I want to see implemented mechanically for the other subclasses for the yeah. artificer as, as we move forward. You know, yeah. The thing is, like, I hope that artificers have forgotten about in other expansions to fifth edition. Like, I hope that it's supported. Like, it didn't get any alternate class features in Tasha's uh, variant class features like the other classes did. Maybe it doesn't need them. It would have been nice anyway to have some options. And so what I hope is that for as much as we've gotten new uh, warlock invocations for as much as we get new spells for as much as there's expansion on the existing classes i hope that artificer gets that level of support moving forward and the fact that armorer is included you know after it's you know the, it's not in the eberron uh book it's in this one it tells me like yeah that's gonna happen this is this we're bringing this one in right artificer is mm -hmm. part of the game it's the first new full class we've gotten this many years into fifth edition uh, and, and it beat out the, whatever's going to become of the psychic uh, <laughs> at some point. Uh, and so, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I really like it. I really enjoy it. The, you know, it, it's a very fun class. The mechanics mm -hmm. of it are great. I, I'm, I have a lot of ideas about how I would use it. Um, and, and, and how I would change it if it's going to be, uh, you know, fully integrated. And I, I'm, I like that versatility. Yeah. I love that you get to switch things up so much that you're not locked into one thing necessarily. And that you get, the, you get all these decision points on how to make something. And, and there's not many things in fifth edition that really reward system mastery like that. A lot of things in fifth edition, which I think is for the better mm -hmm. really are like, listen, you do this one thing, you do it well. All you need to know is this thing, right? Artificers like, well, you want to know about magic items, you got spells, you want to know what exactly you're going to be doing with this character and how they're going to fit in with the party. It's not obvious in the way that, say, Barbarian or Cleric or Rogue is. Um, and in that sense, it's, it's the fact that it's come out so much later in 5th edition, I think is good. Because I think if it was there from the beginning, there'd be a lot of people maybe struggling with it or, or how, do I, how does this work or I don't really, you know. But enough people have played 5th edition, enough people, even if it's their first rpg that it now's a good time to introduce a really complicated class yeah. more complicated than others right that now's a good time to have something with a lot of options that you can do a lot of different things with and like when i think of its nearest equivalent to me as the warlock a lot of the criticisms of warlock that i see at least is like it's just complicated it's a lot of different ways you can go wrong with it and make mm -hmm. a character that's just like cannot do what you want it to do and i could see that happening for artificer but I see those things as strengths, right? The fact that that can happen, you can make a character that might not work the way you want it to, means that you can make one that really does what you want it to. And it's up to the players and the DM to make sure that you don't get a dud, right? Mm -hmm. Like to make sure that you've got a character that, that fits your idea and is interesting and engaging to play. Uh, and so in that sense, Artificer hits everything. It's like an A minus to me yeah it's, yeah it's up there it's one of the best but the difference between a minus and an a plus is those little details you know yeah it's yeah it's all um, so yeah so i have an idea like so let's let's just let's just talk quickly about some concepts for artificer that aren't iron man because that's the big obvious one yes mean, right um 
yeah. what like because I have a, a very specific example that I, and I think I have a, a, a cool subclass for it. But what's what what's yours? <laughs> what, what do you see when you see it when you think artificer? What's your concept you do? So I you know my first one was vigorous Rex, my alchemist that just does things with the landscape. Um, the it, you know the next one would be like some kind of rune smith or something mm -hmm. would be really interesting. Um, the the others I would have is like a Doctor Frankenstein kind of thing where you're using science and sorcery and magic to produce something that isn't quite what you expect, it's but is something life. that's like different. It's bold, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. A, a new Prometheus, you yeah. know, like especially if you lean into the fact that like you are the one and only artificer. There are no others, and to me, in most campaign settings, that's how I would want to do it because it does reinforce the fact that you're supposed to be experimenting and innovating. One of the things I don't like about the class is that there's not really any rules that, that emulate that or that model experimentation and innovation. You're using the same spells, the, you know, uh, infusing the same magic items. There are a few unique infusions that we haven't really seen before, but for the most part, you're accessing things that are tried and true. And, by reimagining it as like, no, you're the first. You're literally the first. No one else can make magical effects out of mundane objects. No one else can make magic items the way you do. Yeah, you know. And and I, and I would say to that point uh, that a good way to frame uh, more of a technology based uh, uh, artificer, you could you could argue this point to the DM like, what if there's a new god and he wants to introduce technology and you are his avatar. You're a demigod, yeah. you're anything. You're the idea, you're the inception of technology into this world as you go out and go, well, you know, you instead of just hammering this metal, you can like make it work together. You can put these pieces right. together and they work on their own. You give them a little yeah. bit of oomph, you know, and so that's yeah. one way to do that. Um, uh, I thought I totally yeah, thought you were going to say Rick Sanchez, but uh, uh, I well, for one, Rick Sanchez is is what comes to mind when I think of an artificer, especially alchemist. Yeah, um, which is why I was upset that homunculus was was uh, moved to uh, an, an infusion. But to kind of come back to how prevalent artificers are in your world, there's the one end which is like Eberron, Ravnica, Kaladesh. Artificers are part and parcel of the setting. There's sort of the middle ground of. The, the the gnomes and and, and uh, priests of Gond and, and Lantern in the Forgotten Realms. There's Tinker gnomes and Dragon Lance, um, and like at the other end of this is the I'm the first one. And when you look at sort of the the cultural base, the the material base of of the the worlds of D and D, it does have that kind of pseudo medievalism to it. Mm -hmm. But the, the the fact that there's things like plate armor. The fact that these seeming, you know, big sailing ships and the like, this isn't like the Middle Ages. This is the Renaissance. It's the, yeah. it's the turning point into the modern era or the early modern era, rather. And like, that's why I think firearms in D&D are fine, right? It's a good 150 years where plate armor and firearms are on the battlefield together. Yeah. And <laughs> when I think of that, I go like Leonardo da Vinci type character. Mm hmm designs and ideas ahead of their time that seem outlandish and fantastical and like, Oh my God, what's going on? And you get to play that and have it be real in, yeah. in the sense of the game world. Right. And have it be reinforced with the mechanics of the class and, and to stand out as something unique. Cause I see the artificer as unique. They are not like others, which is why I'm mad that they have spell casting. <laughs> Well, I mad. understand Just, that. Why it gets to me, you know. But yeah, I mean, like, hell, Da Vinci made a self-propelled car, like a self-propelled wagon. That's a real thing. Somebody rebuilt his design, and guess what? When you wind it all up, it moves. <laughs> like, right, I mean, right. you know, he made flying machines. So yeah, sure. he is an artificer. My other, my other concept for this, Jim, and this is where you would, we'd need to come up with our own subclass here. But I want to make MacGyver. I want to make the guy who just yeah. knows how everything works and they don't have to work together. He, if you give him some bubble gum and some duct tape, he creates the thing he needs to work as yeah. it does. And guess what? He doesn't like guns. So get out of here, artillerist. We don't need you. Right. I'm going to make some shit <laughs> that's going to like do what we need it to do. And I don't have to like directly uh -huh. kill anybody, but like a handyman, sure. like 
Like I would man. love to see yeah. like a handyman. It doesn't matter where he is. He's going to pull some stuff out of his pack and build a wall or get through that door. Or it doesn't, I, I don't know. Like I, I, I don't know what that would look like, but sure. It, I'd go alchemist with that. Um, we, we touched a bit on this uh, in the, in the episode about tools mm -hmm. where a tool, and this is going to sound dumb and obvious is a tool yeah. versatility. You can interface and interact with the game world. And, and I think the example we use there is like going into a dungeon and bringing shovels and picks and things like that and remodeling the place. Well, I don't like that. There's a wall here. I'm going to knock it down. Mm -hmm. Right. And that tools open that space up for you. And the artificers like, I, I, I'll raise you that, <laughs> you know, I could do one better having tools and paying attention to what they do and what you can do with them is, is something that the class rewards. And yeah, a sort of versatile, uh, you know, Mr. Fix it, handyman MacGyver, I think it warrants its own subclass, but I also think you could reimagine alchemist, yeah. uh, as that, uh, yeah. That's that. I mean, at the very least, it fits better than the other three. Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah. Go. If you weren't going to create your own, definitely Alchemist. I know. Yeah, we have gone a little long, and I think uh, I think that's okay. This big class, lots of concept around it, lots of mechanical mm -hmm. discussion around it. Um, I, I, there might be a discussion, not not for this video, of like how to really integrate the Alchemist into your world and and make it fit so that it's like your world doesn't become an Eberron clone. Which maybe you want mm -hmm. that. Sound kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, but taken as its own class, I, I think it's a very valuable addition to fifth edition. Mm -hmm. And I hope it's not the last new class we see for the game. <laughs> oh, I, I, I want to know what else they got. Well, I completely you know. agree. And as far as that conversation on, uh, integrating into your world and going along on things, if you go on over to Patreon and subscribe, uh, you can get a podcast where we do like an hour and a half, sometimes two hours every week. And so maybe we'll uh, do that show over there. Who knows? Um, yeah, but, really uh, just take our time. Yeah, just take our time. And hey, we get to do it in half the time because we're artificers. So. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Let's read a patron question. In case y'all didn't know, we've got a whole community over on Patreon with lots of different rewards. We've got a whole other podcast. There's a level with a hangout, discounts, and all kinds of stuff. And we read a question from one of our patrons every week here on the podcast. So here we go. <clears throat> okay, we got a Patreon question here for a little warm-up action. Uh, mm -hmm. I personally don't care for spell scrolls. So instead, spell scrolls are often just limited use magic items with a unique flavor tailored to the spell. What are your mm -hmm. favorite examples of magic items flavored into weird objects? Well, this is going to be a shock to everybody. Jim knows what I'm about to say. <laughs> what do you got? But they're called ciphers. They are called ciphers. <laughs> and, yeah, that was my first and, thought as uh, well. Yeah. Like, and, yeah. you know, I don't know. Like, scrolls, like, I don't really see the the hate on them. I, I mean, they're fine. They're just magical writings if you can read it. Like, I think that if you can read magical writing, that's why I love the, the rogue ability. Sure. Uh, you should be able to cast them. But, uh, sure. you know. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, I, I, I for, like they're very specific though, right? Like they scrolls are like one of these legacy items from D and D where mm -hmm. you know the first casters are magic users and clerics, and scrolls make sense for them. Magic users have a spell book. Actually, original D and D, both clerics and when magic users have a book of spells, um, and for like clerics, it's a you know, it's like a holy scroll, a prayer scroll or something like that. Magic users have a scroll that has, a, you know, an incantation on it that they can copy into their spell books. But as those concepts have sort of moved beyond the original and it encompass a much wider array of, of concepts and then other classes are made, like, does it make sense that a ranger would have a spell scroll? Right. Does it make sense that a druid would have a spell scroll? I'd argue that druids would try to not even have language at all, given that it's an invention of civilization, or at least some druids. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, and so Scrollers, I do think it's appropriate. Cave paintings. Right. Cave yeah. paintings. Right. What's all this writing about? That's sure. That's sure not in the state of nature. Uh, <laughs> so I think it's absolutely appropriate. And my first thought was ciphers as well. You know, there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do just by borrowing from the inspiration of ciphers in, in Numenera or the cipher system, because the whole point of those is that this is a discrete effect that happens once. And some of them, I forget the terms that cipher uses, but some of them are like 
can be anything, can be mundane objects or the like, uh, and then others have this sort of, this was something else once and you're using it for a different purpose than it was intended. The classic example being like, this was a battery or something, now you're using it as a weapon uh, or mm -hmm. you know, you're know, you you're shocking someone with it or whatever. Um, and so in that sense, you might want to take inspiration from that, but sticking within D&D, man, my first thought is that they're just temporary spells that someone or something mm -hmm. like you read a thing somewhere uh, and now you know this spell once, right? Maybe they read it on a wall chiseled into, you know, the whatever. And like anyone that reads it can can have that. Or maybe you set some kind of timer on it or whatever, like once a day someone can read this, you know, but, uh, you know, depending on what spell it is, maybe everybody could do that. Or maybe you have to have Arcana to do that, you know? Um, it could be like runes inscribed on a rock or, or other, some other kind of durable material gifts from supernatural beings, you know, uh, magical organs, right? <laughs> like yeah. I love the idea of a magical creatures being butchered and it's like, all right, you get the spleen, you get the gallbladder, somebody take the eyes and they, you know, they then become single use magical items, you know? Yeah, you um, eat the eyes of this thing and you get dark vision for 12 hours. I mean, that's... Right, right, yeah. Something like that. Well, also, like, uh, much like Cypher, where it used to, it was a piece of something else, like, what if there was, like, you know, a magical construct that was mostly destroyed, but you find one gauntlet? And yeah. so, you know, you have this gauntlet, you put it on, and for, like, 10 hours, you have... It's like, like you know, it's like strength or gauntlets of ogre power yeah. that work for a very short time. Uh, yeah, and then the magic yeah. is used up because there's nothing fueling it. It's just what was left. Sure. Yeah. Like yeah, any, I mean, of, that, any of those things can be. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Is like it does when you when you sort of expand yourself away from spell scrolls thing, you could just talk about like yeah, these are single use magic, and they could be reflective of spells themselves or magic items. Um, I really like them. Right. Like I really like single use magical effects because you can throw in something really high level, and you don't have to worry about it all like gonna really mess up your game some of my mm -hmm. favorites for low level parties are wish and gate and other ninth level spells because number one how often do you get to cast them right so you're introducing something yeah. that a lot of players don't normally get access to and second they can while they're big and when they get used it's a big thing but that's okay and and like it should be right if you're doing something really powerful and it's just once let them let them open a gate somewhere and, and travel there or bring someone forth. First off, they're second level and they're trying to open a gate and bring someone out from it, then good luck. <laughs> you know, yeah, even there's if gonna it, be all, all kinds of things on the other side. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, or, you know, or, or, you know, wish, like let them get in trouble with a wish. Yeah, that's how I see it is these mm -hmm. are things that you can use to add complications and like adventure to your game. You know, when I say that, it, it's that it creates opportunities to propel the game forward and, and to like, oh, we did that. Now we got to deal with the ramifications of it. And, and oh, we're using really high level magic. So, you know, the Mages Guild is coming after us because we they weren't mm -hmm. sanctioned. We, we didn't get their stamp of approval, you know, um, so yeah. that can be really or, fun. Yeah. Or an inevitable shows up and it's like, hey, listen, uh, you did not clear this with the fates or uh, the time. Yeah anything yeah. and uh this is gonna be a warning for you buddy but you do mm -hmm. this again you know like you're on the yeah, you're we, on the radar of the of the inevitables yeah we've laid out how uh, mortals can gain access to magical power you can't skip ahead right there's nine circles nine degrees yeah. of, of magical power you can't go from two to nine sorry uh <laughs> something like that using those cheat codes <laughs> right using those cheat codes <laughs> Uh, but yeah, temporary use spell scrolls. You know, don't use spell scrolls. Uh, you know, uh, for one, they're vulnerable to fire and water, <laughs> so they're easily <laughs> destroyed. <laughs> uh, but but even like moving beyond just like words on a piece of paper, words on hide, words on a stone tablet, words on metallic tablets or sheets. Um, you know, something that's ephemeral. Maybe the druid gets their spell scrolls by like looking at patterns of leaves or clouds or something like that. You know, the warlock or the cleric, depending on their domain, like reading the entrails of an animal that they've sacrificed or something, you know. Maybe a necromantic mm -hmm. spell scroll is the pattern of maggots on a decomposing corpse, you know. <laughs> like, oh yeah, I can. And 
in that sense, uh, you know, you can put this, you can put it into the player's hands of whether they want to find one of these or not. Because I think spell scrolls are one of those magic items that is, are easily forgotten, right? They're easily forgotten as part of treasure. They're easily forgotten as something that could be of use. And putting them in, putting it in the player's hands when they find it, you know, with, with reasonable limits, right? I'm thinking of Invisible Sun, another, you know, Monty Cook Games game where once a day you can just be like, yeah, I'm going to meditate and get a single use spell. Right. Like I just it's going to, you know, they're, they're not big effects. They're not whatever. But it's like I can meditate and and get this random thing because, you know, I'm a magical being in a magical world and I got magical needs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not going to sing. I'm a material girl, but no, no, you're not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, and then let's let's talk about the big thing which is that this is the whole thing an artificer does, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> experimental items and, and yeah, I cooked this thing up last night, try it out, you know, see what happens. I think it's going to do this, you know, um, and maybe you introduce an element of randomness where there was otherwise certainty to it, or I don't, you know, maybe they have to pass some sort of check in order to get the full benefit of it. Yeah. That's uh, those are ways you could homebrew it, but, yeah, mm -hmm. objects other than, you know, your other than your own finger bone, some sort of like relic for clerics. You know, this is a saint's oh, yeah. finger bone, or this is our founders. You know, their toe. <laughs> it gives you like one revivify. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or it's like your loved one gives you a lock of hair, and and says that they'll you know that it will protect you. Like single use magic items are one of those things you can do that's like otherwise mundane actions and objects can have magical significance because of the intention and and like significance of them right so yeah you're, you're going away on an adventure and you're leaving behind your family they give you something and that act of giving imbues it with magical power because of the significance of it because of the passion that they have the the, the emotional investment it lets them have that and you know whether or not that it don't always work for starting equipment it doesn't work if you're going you know rules is written but it is something you can use and you and if you know if you're a home dm you can always change it you can always say like yeah everybody starts with one of these um mm -hmm. and that this is how mm -hmm. you can reflect those kind of moments that seem mundane but are actually could actually become magical because magic's all over mm -hmm. the D, D world i i i'm not sure that there's that clear distinction between mundane and magical Oh yeah, no. The, I, I love the idea of you know your your loved one giving you a lock of their hair and saying in your in your most desperate moment, hope this protects you, and you mm -hmm. know you have a protection from evil when you focus sure. on that right before a battle, and that's yeah, it. It just that, you know yeah. happens. And that's that, it. It just happens once. Gone. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, and so yeah, I, I like those kinds of uh, ways to think about it. You learned it in a dream, you know. You heard a rumor. I don't know what it, an animal told you. Think mm -hmm. about. I think about the interactions with the player in the world and any of them could become a single use magical effect. Mm hmm.